All right, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you're ready for this. I hope you're ready to learn the seven-figure skill set of all on X, a crash course on the surgical principles. Are you ready for that? Are you ready to, to learn how to get results like this and this? Right? Look at that symmetry. That's freehand, baby. I don't play no games. But what we're also going to learn how to avoid this. Surgical catastrophes that look like that. We're covering all of it. So what I need from you, I need you to get your butt in a chair. And I also need you to put that phone that you are so chronically addicted to away. No TikTok, no Snapchat, no whatever the hell y'all are using. Just turn the phone off. One hour. Dedicate yourself to learn this beautiful, beautiful procedure that we all know and love all on X. So without further ado, let's jump right in. If you want to learn some of these surgical principles of all on X from start to finish, this will be one of the most useful pieces of content that you've come across. But remember, it's not recommended to just focus on the surgery and ignore the process. This is a multi specialty procedure. And if you're going to do this and charge your patient upwards of 20 to 50 K per case, you need to know both. All right. And you're going to see why in this presentation, because when you don't know both chaos ensues, this presentation is going to break down just the surgical principles. So put your phone on DND, like I said, buckle up and watch this whole video if you want to learn some keys to the trade. Before I move any further, allow me to show you some actual proof backing my opening statements so you know I actually do this for real and I know what I'm talking about in regards to all on X. In all these cases, I did both the surgery and the prost or the restoration, all freehand. No MUA guides, no bone reduction guides, no guides, okay? Just my brain. I don't believe in guides for FP3. It's my opinion. For reference, I do anywhere from 10 to 20 arches per month. So this is a standard case that I do upper PFAST, lower all on four. Another example. And for reference, PFAST stands for pterygoid fixated arch stabilizing technique and a lower single. In other words, an all on four with pterygoids is what PFAST really means. I've done severe perio cases with limited bone like this. So you can see sinuses are super pneumatized. The teeth are hanging on for dear life. And what do we do? We clean house, upper P fast, lower all on four. I've done cases with gross decay and infection such as this. So you can see all the infection here. This needs to be cleaned house right? That's what we do in a lot of these cases. We clean house, we remove infection, and this is what we get. This is a tough case, all right? This was, I remember this is about a 20 to a 22 millimeter tilted here, 25 millimeter pterygoids, lower all on six. If I have bone in the lower posterior, I add six because I don't like cantilevers at all. We'll get into that. I've done revision cases due to visible transition lines like this. This is a catastrophic surgical error. Don't ever blame your lab or your prosthodontist for this. Garbage in, garbage out. We all heard that in dental school. This is garbage in, and this is what you get. Visible transition line, MUA is exposed. This is what the surgery looked like. And this is what the surgery looked like when I was done with it. So we removed everything. We started from scratch. Upper P fast. I did not touch the lower. I left it alone. And we re removed and hid that transition line. I've done cases with severely, severely pneumatized sinuses. This is probably the most severely pneumatized sinus I've ever seen. The result, same thing as always, upper P fast. All right. These cases are doable. You just have to know how to do them. I've done cases, revision cases where I've had to remove 13 implants, a lot of which were failing. All right. So here's the before, here's the after. I've done severe infection cases where there was no anterior bone to work with. The result, endpoint configuration, bilateral pterygoids, lower all on four. As you can see, these cases start to look the same, which signifies these cases are now routine and a predictable practice. 
Let's not forget about the prost, aka what your patients are actually paying for. Nobody's coming to you for an implant. Nobody cares to buy an implant. They're looking to buy confidence. How do you give patients confidence? By giving them a new smile, right? And I obsess over this part. I obsess over the prost. I make sure my access holes are perfect every case. It's very easy for this not to be the case. This is all done during surgery, my friends. Don't think the lab can just magically fix all your crappy access holes. Sure, they, they have some wiggle room and they can use angled screw channels, etc. But it's our responsibility as the doctor who's doing the surgery to ensure these kind of results, okay? The intaglio, we want to train the tissue the correct way. We don't want diapers, as I call it. We don't want a super concave intaglio where food can get trapped and implants can then fail. Another example, axis holes, always on point. I obsess over this. Lower, axis holes, another example, okay? If you're interested in how I get access holes and prosthetic outcomes like this, stay tuned until the end of the presentation. All right, let's go over who this presentation is actually for. This is for you if you have a passion for implant surgery, specifically all on X, and want to learn more about the principles of how to do this procedure. If you're tired of bread and butter general dentistry like I was, and your goal is to expand your surgical skill sets and be able to offer this highly requested procedure in your own practice, keep watching. If you've ever been confused on some of the general overarching questions of all on X, like how do you screw on the prosthetic the same day of surgery? How much alveoloplasty do you have to do in order to avoid those transition line problems that you saw before? How do you avoid infections? How do you avoid bad results in unhappy patients? If you have some of these questions, this is for you. Keep watching. If you want a system that breaks down how to do these surgeries in a systematic algorithmic manner, decreasing the chances of stress and complications, keep watching. And if you want to be able to work towards offering your patients a life-changing transformation with immediate same-day results, this will be incredibly valuable. And here's the truth. You can absolutely learn all on X the right way, despite how unrealistic it seems or what people tell you is impossible. I was repeatedly told it wasn't worth doing these cases because of the stress and complications that can happen. But it was coming from people who don't really do these cases. If you do these cases the right way and follow the correct principles, you will significantly reduce your stress and complication rate. I very rarely have complications. Honestly, I sleep well at night because I do this the right way. And if I could learn and produce the outcomes that you just saw with minimal complications... In just a few short years out of dental school, which is unheard of, so can you. We aren't that different. We're both dentists, aren't we? We both got our pieces of paper. So what's stopping you? You are. You're stopping yourself. It all starts with the understanding of the thing. Once you understand the thing, you can go through the sequential steps and actually doing the thing. But first, you need the knowledge of the thing, a.k.a. all on X, and that's why you're here. It's very easy to do these surgeries the wrong way. I see it all the time. And you're going to deal with unwanted and unnecessary complications resulting in pissed off and upset patients. You need to be fully informed about all the essential details to ensure a predictable surgical and prosthetic outcome every single time. I'm talking about building a proper foundation and understanding the how Right, understand how to do these cases using an efficient surgical workflow while obsessing about the prosthetic outcome. Otherwise, chaos ensues, which you will see. One of the main issues that I see far too much in all the revision surgeries I've done is a general lack of understanding of how much bone reduction or alveoloplasty is actually required to hide the transition line and ensure enough prosthetic thickness. It's a devastating surgical error that is easily avoidable. Okay, we'll get to that. But if you're watching this, you're already on the right track in stopping yourself from making these idiotic, avoidable mistakes. All right, limiting beliefs. Let's touch on this. 
because I had them too, that you need to protect yourself from. Only specialists can do all on X. What you have to realize is some of the best full art surgeons in the world are general dentists. Why? It's not just because general dentists understand restorative dentistry at a high level, which makes the process easier for them. It's because these select GPs are literally obsessed with both their surgical and prosthetic outcomes. That's it, right? If you have an obsession towards something and you work towards mastery, the more likely you are to reach it. So let's just get that straight right now. Don't think you can't do this just because you're not a specialist. Don't let dental school and these naysayers and people who don't, people who can't do it themselves brainwash you. All right. These are cases that were done by a specialist who exited the practice before my arrival and left me to restore. This is a criminal act. This right here is a criminal act as a doctor. Okay. This didn't happen once or twice. It happened many times. And I'm the one that has to pick up the pieces and fix them because these people don't deserve this. If you pay 50 K right now, I want you to envision that you're this patient and you paid 50 K what would be going through your head right now? You took out a mortgage to pay for this. And this was the result. Now I'm not here to say that all specialists don't know what they're doing and get bad results. There's no shortage of GPs who make the same catastrophic errors just like this and produce bad results. I'm simply showing you that even specialists aren't experts in a procedure. They don't really know or care to learn or understand, even though they're specialists, right? Not just because you're a specialist doesn't mean you're a master at all in X, right? And with that being said, I personally know world-class specialists, oral surgeons, periodontists, prosthodontists, who do these cases at the absolute highest level with incredible surgical and prosthetic results, perfect results. I also know GPs who are doing all on X at the highest level, who also produce incredible surgical and prosthetic results. What's my point? It doesn't matter if you were a specialist or a GP. Either one can produce exceptional results or horrific results like this. All right, get that through your head. So if you learn and understand the core principles of all on X, like adequate bone reduction, implant positioning, soft tissue management, timing of your implant, cortical bone sites, etc., and get the necessary training, you can do this. I am living proof of that. Now, before I dive into the specifics of the surgical principles, a little background of why I'm doing this in the first place. So for those of you who aren't aware, my name is Dr. Neil Chowdhury. I graduated dental school less than three years ago, and I had this far-fetched dream of being able to do these full mouth, all on X implant rehabs. At the time, it seemed totally impossible and downright deranged for a general dentist to be doing all on X. And here's a throwback to dental school, third year, probably just did my first cleaning and thought I was the man, right? We all start here, my friends. We all start here. Everybody starts at ground zero. And when you're on ground zero, you are being brainwashed by dental school faculty as they demonize you for even thinking about placing single implants after graduation, let alone doing full mouth implant cases. They told us it was only for the specialists, which couldn't be farther from the truth. Over the last three years, I've dedicated my life and I've become clinically obsessed on learning full arch. All right, it's not a joke. This is what I do. I don't party, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't do nothing. What I do is I work and I learn this game. That is what my passion is and that's what I do. And I can sit here and tell you, I was able to turn that dream that I had in dental school, even though I was being brainwashed, to never even think about placing an implant into my reality. I now work as the sole doctor at an all on X implant center 
where I handle the surgery and the prosthetic, utilizing a fully digital workflow. Typically, implant centers have a surgeon to do the surgery and the prosthodontist who handles the prosthetic. They usually don't do both. I do both. And I can't emphasize how important it is for the doctor who's doing the surgery to fully understand the prost. Otherwise, what happens? Complications and transition line problems like you just saw. All right, so I started to do this. And after documenting all my cases and CTs and putting them on my social platforms for you guys to see, doctors began reaching out and asking me all on next specific questions. Doctors like GPs who are interested in getting started with all on X, but don't know where the hell to start. GPs who are currently doing all on X, but aren't fully comfortable and have gaps in their surgical and prosthetic knowledge. Doctors who are doing analog conversions, my heart goes out to you, and want to learn the digital workflow. Periodontists who don't get a lot of fixed full arch training in their residencies and want to learn more about all on X principles. Periodontists who are interested in the surgical aspects of the procedure. Even dental students who wanted to skip the general dentistry route like I did and go straight into the implant world. And I did g general dentistry for about four months before I left. All of them are asking similar questions. And within days of helping these doctors, both remotely on Zoom calls and, and going to some of their offices in person to help out with their all on X cases, like Dr. Canal here, we ended up doing a PFAS upper and a lower all on four. I got to see problems and issues that they were struggling with. Surgical protocols, PROS protocols. I mean, you can, once you see it, you know it, right? And I noticed a recurring theme immediately. And there's only so many questions one can actually have over a niche procedure like this. Just like anything else, right? Everything is niche. Fillings are niche. Crowns are niche. How many questions can you really have about doing a crown? How much do you reduce? Undercuts? Blah, 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 right? Same thing with all on X. Yes, there's more things to consider because it's a full mouth rehab. But once you understand all the facets of the procedure, the questions become easy to answer. When you do this at volume and you deal with complications of somebody else and you're doing 10, 20 arches a month over over time, it becomes like brainless, right? And that's kind of where I'm at. With that being said, let's just dive into the surgical principles of all on X. So let's jump right in. The steps to surgical success in all on X. Part one, the flap. One of the core fundamentals in all on X is to ensure you are laying a full thickness flap. For the love of God, lay a full thickness flap. If you end up doing a split thickness flap, and fail to cut through the periosteum, you will end up with a shredded, bloody mess. There will be significantly more bleeding, which will make the management of the surgery much harder. Why? Well, number one, you'll have reduced visibility of your surgical field. You'll start confusing anatomical landmarks like the mental nerve and the sinus with periosteum. And you're going to place your implants according to incorrect landmarks because you've left periosteum all over the place. There's going to be so much more blood that you're going to have to suction and gauze and your assistants are going to be stressed and it's going to make your whole surgery not fun. And let's not forget about the patient. The patient's going to have significantly more pain and inflammation during the healing process. If there's periosteum left all over the place, it'll look like a shredded, mushy, pulled pork type of appearance. It's ugly. Okay. So get underneath the periosteum. You want a nice, clean, beautiful flap, seeing nothing but white bone. All right. If you get underneath the periosteum, your flap will reflect easily. If you do this correctly, you'll have decreased bleeding and an increased visibility during surgery, leading to a more efficient and smooth case. You'll have decreased post-op pain and decreased inflammation for your patient which leads to a happy patient, which leads to more business for you. This is especially important if you are doing next day temporary deliveries. I personally have switched to delivering all of my temporary same day, but I used to do next day deliveries. 
and the bulk of my patients had minimal swelling. They'd come the next day and they were fine. They were like, yeah, doc, I feel good. That's what you want, right? And of course, everybody heals differently based on age, medical history, etc. But we, as doctors, play a big part in the recovery process based on how we conduct the surgery. Don't be a butcher. Right? We're not butchers here. These are living, sentient beings. These patients come to you and expect to be treated as such, right? Edentulous maxillary flaps are much more difficult to reflect. We all know this. You have more tenacious periosteal attachments and scar tissues, which can make reflection more difficult to deal with. In such scenarios, I will do a midline incision through the frenum if I see that there's too much tension that could result in an unwanted tear. By laying a vertical release at the midline, I will start my reflection in the anterior zone and I'll work my way back. This will increase your speed and efficiency during your reflection and prevent any unwanted tears. Once I make my initial incision down to bone, I'm going to repeat that. Once I make my initial incision down to bone, we're not going halfway through the tissue and then making, no. I need you to score the bone with your blade and go all the way. Okay. I'll flip my 15 blade backwards after that and retrace my incision to ensure I've cut any non incised periosteum without making a new incision line. So take your blade all the way to bone, make your incision, flip your blade upside down, retrace that line. That way you don't make a new incision line by accident. All right. I will then use the sharp side of my periosteal and score my incision line again, scraping down to the bone. I want to hear bone when I do this. And that's going to ensure that I've cut through the periosteum. If you do the little things like this, your flap reflection becomes 10 times faster and easier. If you take your blade and go halfway through the tissue and do a split thickness flap, all of what I said before is going to happen to you. All right. You'll hear the most important parts of all next surgery is the flap design and the closure. Don't take these steps lightly as they can make or break your case. And yeah, they are important aspects. Every aspect is important in full arch. Every step is important. You don't take anything lightly. No steps are taken lightly. Okay. Part two, extracting the teeth. Let me just take a little sip here. All right. Part two, extracting the teeth. There are two ways to extract teeth in full arch cases. You can extract the teeth before you lay your full thickness flap. You can extract your teeth after you lay your full thickness flap. And it's personal preference. You're going to have doctors who swear by laying the flap first and then extracting the teeth. I do the opposite. I take out all the teeth before I lay my flap 99% of the time, unless I know the teeth are going to be extremely difficult to deal with. African-American males with concrete D1 like bone, I will generally flap first and I will go over that right now. So what is the flap first technique? So in this technique, you lay your full thickness flap and you're going to remove the whole buckle plate up until your alveoloplasty line, thereby eliminating the bony support, creating perio like teeth. And then I will elevate and extract the teeth because now the teeth are obviously less supported and looser. So why do I personally extract teeth first? Well, I can do atraumatic full mouth extractions very fast and have found ways to increase my speed and efficiency over the years. I like getting all the teeth out in whatever arch I'm working at in two to three minutes, right? No more than five minutes. So then I can just jump right to my flap reflection. And to me, flap reflection is a lot easier after the teeth are out, right? In some cases you can use teeth as fulcrums to make your flap reflection easier. So it's all personal preference, guys. You can do both techniques, see which one you like and stick with it and pivot when you need to pivot, right? What happens if you fracture a root during an all on X case when you're taking out your teeth? Please do not sit there with your high speed hand piece and try to like drill around that little root for 20 minutes. It's a colossal waste of time and completely unnecessary when you were doing full mouth extractions. 
if you fracture a root, move on and extract the rest of the teeth. You can take out the root tip when you do your alveoloplasty. You'll be able to extract the root tip by troughing around that root, right? You're going to remove the bone around that broken root tip, thereby exposing more of that root. And then it'll be very easy to extract. Okay. Full arch is not the same as a single tooth extraction. So you have to get a little bit more creative with it. Don't waste time on stupid things. Okay. All right. Bone reduction, AKA alveoloplasty. So we've already seen this. Not reducing enough bone is one of the most catastrophic surgical errors that can happen for an all in X case. It will create a nightmare for you and your patient. So you have to be especially careful during this step because it's very easy to think you've reduced enough bone when you really have not. So as, as mentioned before, these are all cases that were done by the other provider who left the office last year and I am here to fix them. I'm not going to let another doctor go down as he's pissed off as I am about this. I'm going to fix them. I don't want any lawsuits for anybody. We're all doctors and we have to help each other out. And yes, we need to be educated on what the hell we're doing. Okay. But with that being said, this is wrong. And that's, you don't have to be a specialist or a GP to know that this is wrong. As you can see, these cases need to be done from a prosthetically driven lens. We aren't just placing implants in bone and figuring out the process later. Patients are not paying for implants. They're paying for the prosthetic. Imagine, you know, doing a knee replacement and not caring about the prost. They're, they're buying a prosthetic, right? So the surgery and the prost go hand in hand. You cannot be afraid to reduce bone for FP3 all in X cases, or you will have to redo these cases. All right. So what happens when we don't adequately do enough bone reduction for FP3 all on X cases? Well, one of the primary reasons on why we need to perform adequate bone reduction is to ensure enough prosthetic or restorative space for our all on X restorations. Just like if you do a crown prep, if you don't reduce enough on the occlusal, your crown's going to be super thin and it's going to fracture. So in other words, we need to reduce enough bone to create space for our prosthesis and ensure there is adequate thickness of material to withstand bite force and chewing cycles. If we fail to reduce enough bone, the prosthesis is going to be too thin and fracture over and over again, thereby increasing patient chair time as they will repeatedly need to come in to reprint the broken temporary or worse, you'll have to fix and mill a new zirconia. Resin costs are going to go up because now you have to keep printing out new temporaries for the same patient. And this is if you have a digital workflow, if you don't have a digital workflow and you're doing analog, well, this is going to be even more annoying because now you have to fix, maybe even do another conversion. God knows, right? Depending on how bad it is. The number of headaches are going to go up for you and your staff. And you're going to need to deal with this as your patient will be extremely frustrated and upset. Okay. Ultimately, you will lose the trust of your patient and damage your reputation as a doctor and your business as future patients will write bad reviews after spending 50 K only to be left with a transition line problem that breaks every two weeks. Okay. That's the reality. As mentioned before, the second reason why you need enough bone reduction is to hide the transition line. If you fail to account for this, you will end up with more cases like this, which I have recently redone. All right. More on this at the end of the presentation. This is what happens. All right. You see failed implants, fractured prosthesis, and a pissed off patient. And this is clearly a result of poor prosthetic planning, failed implants, and a fractured prosthetic should not happen. 99% of the time, this should not happen. 
if you're, if you're following the principles and doing these cases right. On the morning of the revision surgery, <clears throat> this patient had this prosthesis in his hand, and he came to me, and he said, Doctor, please help me. I can't, I can't do this anymore. I'm tired. I'm exhausted. I'm, I'm afraid to eat. I don't know if I eat something that's going to fracture. I can't live like this. Like Literally, he was pleading and begging for me to just fix his problem. And this is what happens when you don't know what the hell you're doing. But if you follow the all-in-x principles, you have nothing to worry about. Okay? How do we ensure you've done enough bone reduction? So that's the question you're probably asking. One technique, which I don't personally use myself anymore, but it's a tried and true technique that we should all know as a, as a way to ensure that you've reduced enough. So we're going to use a panadent ruler and measure the patient's high smile line before the surgery. Pro tip, a lot of times when you see patients who haven't been to the dentist in 10 years, they won't know how to smile. They haven't smiled in 10 years. They forgot. So have the patient close their eyes. Try it, try it right now. Close your eyes and smile as big as you can you'll realize if you close your eyes, you're going to smile bigger than if your eyes are open. So have them close your eyes or close their eyes and tell them to smile as big as they can, almost snaring at you. Once they're sedated, you can't have the patient smile, obviously. So it's going to be too late and you're going to be in trouble. So do this before sedation or before you numb the patient. Let's say you're doing a local, a local anesthetic case non-sedation case. Do it before you numb them. Okay. You want to do this during the data collection appointment and take a picture of the high smile line. And if you do that, you'll avoid issues. So let's, let's talk about how to do it now. So the ruler, this is a panda dent ruler. Okay. It's got a nice right angle on it. It's got nice measurements. So measure from the incisal ledge up to the high smile line. So here's the high smile line of the upper lip. Whatever the measurement that you see, you're going to add three millimeters. And that is going to be your alveoloplasty line. So from here, I'm measuring from the incisal ledge up. Oh, you can see it's about a 15 millimeter distance from the incisal ledge. We're going to add three millimeters to that, 18 millimeters. So our alveoloplasty line will be from the incisal ledge up 18 millimeters, and that's our alveoloplasty line. We need to re remove bone up to that point. Otherwise, you'll have a visible transition line. Don't forget to do this in the posterior as well. So she doesn't have posterior teeth. So we're going to go to the canine, measure 15 millimeters, add three. And that 18 millimeter line from the incisal ledge continues from the front to the right side and to the left side. Same thing. This one, there's a little space here. So yeah, it's still 15 millimeters. Continue that line. That is your alveoloplasty line. You cannot forget to measure in the posterior because if you do that, well, this is what happens. This is an incredibly gross surgical error, guys. And it's just like, it's hard to see that. It's hard to see this for people. I've talked to these patients. This patient drives two to three hours each way. Every two to three weeks, he's had to come back to get a new prototype because this fractures. So now we have to redo this case. And this is likely going to be a zygomatic case now because it was done wrong from the beginning. Think about it. Because we did it wrong from the beginning, there is a good chance this is a zygomatic case for a young patient. It's wrong. It's criminal. So after doing these cases of volume, I figured out a special method in order to ensure I've reduced enough bone without utilizing any rulers. So stay tuned until the end of the presentation for details on that. How do we actually perform bone reduction? I utilize a very aggressive alveoloplasty burr that goes on my H&M straight handpiece. I love that straight handpiece. I, I can't do surgery without it. My implant motor is set to one-to-one -to -one at 40,000 RPM for the step. I am reducing bone 
to my alveoloplasty line, ensuring that my bone shelf is parallel to the interpupillary line. You don't want kints. You want to make sure that your plane of your bone is parallel to the, to the eyes, okay? Otherwise, the prosthetic is not going to sit properly. I'm also ensuring everything is rounded and not sharp because I don't want any sharp edges that will potentially perforate my flap or bother my patient. This has happened to me. On the lower jaw, especially towards the posterior, after three months, I've seen that line angle was a little bit sharp and it ripped through my flap and they healed that way. So what do I have to do? I have to go ahead and remove that sharp line angle three months later. Avoid it. I don't make that mistake anymore. Round everything. Don't rush this step. You now understand the importance of bone reduction for these cases and what happens when you don't do this step correctly. All right, step four, degranulation and irrigation. And then we'll get to the fun stuff, implant placement. This step is often overlooked and not done to the standard that it should be. Once you finish your alveoloplasty, it is imperative that you degranulate all the sockets, clean any remnants of infection that has been illuminating for years or decades. For super infected cases, I'll often utilize 3% hydrogen peroxide, a weak acid, before I degranulate. This will cause the degranulation tissue to, to clump up almost, which will be easier to remove in one fair swoop, utilizing your serrated curette. I also regularly utilize degranulation burrs to really ensure that the sockets are perfectly clean, degranulated, and ready for implant placement. We don't want to place implants in nasty, infected sites, all right? Very important. Then, once all that's done, I'll rinse everything with saline, and I spend a lot of time using copious amounts of irrigation, and I really flush out all that alveoplasty, bone remnants, mush, bone spurs, infection, everything. I irrigate everything out, all right? Because if you don't do that, what's going to happen? Your patient's going to be irritated. And you're going to close the tissue over all that, over all that junk in there? No. Have fun dealing with that after the fact. If you don't do this and bone, fr and bone fragments are left behind and buried under your flap, well, like I said, your patient's just going to complain. You'll have to reflap everything back open to address this issue. Not ideal. So not properly degranulating and irrigating can also lead to infection. So the little things go a long way. Rounding out your line angles of bone. Irrigating to five minutes instead of one minute. Huge difference in success. In your success rates, right? The last thing we want to do is place our implants in, into an infected site. We're basically asking our implants to fail. So really take the time and save yourself the headache and potential complications that can arise because we do not want to deal with implant failure and failed cases if we can avoid them. Common sense. All right, step five, implant placement, the fun stuff. Here we go. The question I always had before learning the fundamentals of all on X was how in the hell can you screw on teeth the same day of surgery? And the implants just stay and not fall out, right? That was my number one most mind-bending confusion about all on X before I knew anything, right? Won't the implants just fall out after the surgery, right? So this is referred to as an immediate load. And when done correctly, the implants actually don't fail and they stay screwed in the patient's jaw. But you have to meet the requirements to do an immediate load. So let's talk about it. Understanding composite torque value. There is a term referred to as composite torque value, CTV, which is the cumulative value of all of your implants combined. We want a minimum CTV of 120 newton centimeters across all of our implants to satisfy our immediate load requirement. So for example, if you were doing a standard upper or lower all on four, and you're placing four implants with the expectation to do an immediate load, each implant needs to have 
a torque value of at least 30 newton centimeters each. So each implant times 30 newton centimeters equals 120 newton centimeters for an all on four. So this technically is good. You can load that. The goal is to place our implants and generate a torque of at least 32 newton centimeters. I always aim for 50 to 70 newton centimeters on every single one of my implants. From my maxillary cases, I aim for a composite torque value of 350 to 400 newton centimeters, as I always do with traditional PFAST and place pterygoids for every single one of my maxillary arches. All right, that's six implants total. If one of my implants has a torque of less than 30 newton centimeters, what do I do? I aim to place a wider diameter implant and size up. Sometimes I aim to place a longer implant and engage a cortical site like the nasal crest or the end point or the lateral nasal rim. And I'm always doing this for every, every implant that I place. I am trying to engage a cortical bone site. Or you have to resort to a remote anchorage solution other than a pterygoid, we have a zygomatic, we have a transnasal, okay? We have nasal crest. You know, there's, there's plenty of areas in the maxilla that God has given us to place implants. So we need to learn how to use them. Almost every all on study shows that failed implants all had one thing in common, a low torque value. So we don't want to place implants with 10 newton centimeters of torque because we're asking for that implant to fail. So we safely want to generate as much torque as humanly possible per implant, especially for all on X. We're not doing single onesie twosies here. We are loading a prosthesis the same day. And primary stability is one of the keys to a successful case and a, and a successful load. All right. When we screw on our teeth the same day and we splint all of our implants together with our prosthesis, our implants are now considered cross arch stabilized and are able to function and heal as a unit. So this heavily aids in the healing process. That's pretty crazy to think about. So you can place six implants, splint them together. The implants are going to heal better now because they're a unit. They're healing as a unit. So even if one implant has, let's say 25 Newton centimeters and the other ones have 70 Newton centimeters, you're still going to be okay, most likely, with that 25 newton centimeter implant because it's being supported by the other implants, all right? That's the reason we can screw on our teeth the same day, assuming we have achieved at least 120 newton centimeters of composite torque. So where do I personally aim to place my implants? So I like my axis holes to be in the lateral positions, in the first or second premolar positions, and then behind the first molar in the second molar positions, okay? And once again, note the axis holes here. This is not by accident, this is by design. And this is what I mean by prosthetically driven. We want a well-balanced prosthesis because something like this will last. Something like this, if done correctly, will last. All right, that's what we want for our patients who pay you 50K. You want your work to last. AP spread. So when you do these cases, you want to strive to get as much anterior, so anterior, posterior spread as possible. In other words, you want to get your axis holes as far posterior as possible because this limits or eliminates the cantilever entirely for your prosthesis. As you can see above, I place pterygoids here and have my axis holes coming out of the second molar position. We've achieved maximum spread with no cantilever. If we did not place pterygoids in this situation, we would have a one tooth cantilever, which is totally fine and acceptable, guys. All right. But if I can avoid a cantilever, I will. So let's say I didn't place this terry here or here. And this was the position of my last axis hole for my tilted. And we had one tooth as a cantilever. Cool. Totally fine with that. It's acceptable. It's clinically acceptable. All right. I like my occlusion to be not heavy if I do have a tooth behind my last access hole. I want it to be light. Okay, so my occlusion, I want to be mainly around here. In this situation, I can have a normal balanced occlusion because I have support going all the way back to the pterygoid. Okay, 
Last part, tissue management and closure. I hope you guys enjoyed this so far. This step is critical. If you fail to properly suture and close your case, your patient will continue to bleed, experience pain, and potentially develop an infection. Before suturing, I always try to tissue punch around the MUAs to allow proper closure and improved healing around that MUA. And this tissue punching is only done on the maxilla. I do not do it on the mandible. All right, so this is how you want your tissue to look. Excessive KG in this case, right? And sometimes you'll get lucky like that. In this case, palatally placed implants, right? Things look good. Here's what a lower looks like. The tissue should look good three to six months later. Obviously, the patients have to keep up with the hygiene and not smoke and help you. Right, you're helping them, they need to help you, and they need to be responsible as they've invested 50K. So a lot of this is on them as well, but it's on you to place implants properly in the right positions so tissue can heal around your implants, okay? We want to ensure there is enough KG around our implants. Otherwise, the health of our implants will be compromised long term. Because we've done adequate bone reduction, we'll have excess tissue to work with, which we can use to our advantage in these FP3, FP3 cases. And as for closure and suturing, our goal is to really just reapproximate the tissue. So you can do this in many different ways. You can do single interrupted sutures across the whole arch. You can do figure eight sutures in between MUAs. You can do a running suture starting at the midline and going all the way back. You can do the Texas two-step, which is a horizontal mattress all the way back, and then a continuous all the way to the front. Guys, there's many techniques. Ultimately, you want to reapproximate the tissue and make sure no bone is exposed, right? That's it. So you don't have to complicate this. I use all these different techniques in different situations, okay? That concludes our surgical overview. So what now? You have a couple of different options available to you. Option one, you can continue doing what you're doing right now. And eventually you'll hit a brick wall like I did. You'll run out of willpower to learn this skill set. And when that happens, you're going to have to spend over 100K traveling around the world and gathering bits of information, pearls, and knowledge from the countless surgical, prosthetic, and digital trainings, which I had to take to get to this point. And some of those courses weren't really even worth it. And I invested way too much money, but that's the price you have to pay to learn, right? Sometimes you make a good investment and sometimes you make a bad investment. Or option number two, you can come on the most immersive and truly comprehensive all on X journey where I show you not only the secrets to how to do a predictable, flawless surgery, but also the secrets to the prosthetic which is what patients are paying for, all right? And I'm gonna show you this, all while teaching you my fully digital workflow, which has been battle tested over the past year by me and my team. That's the surgery, the prost, and the digital workflow. I'm covering it all. No a la carte bullshit that I had to go through for the past three years and take multiple courses just to learn all of all on X in its entirety. All right, so what's actually covered? So we're going to go over how to read a CT properly and how to treatment plan these cases in less than a minute. So how to read CT scans, all on X CT planning 101, the essentials, guys, that you need to know. Not all the extra crap, just the essentials on how to plan for these cases. I'll teach you how much do you actually alveoloplasty. Where I show you using a CT, I have techniques with just looking at a CT, but also... I'll show you my tried and true techniques that don't involve any rulers or anything like that, among other techniques using other rulers that you haven't seen today. I'm showing you everything, basically, is what I'm saying, right? So you never have a transition line problem. I am passionate about teaching how to never have a transition line problem again in your life because I've had to deal with it so much at this office, all right? I'll teach you how to review slices and plan for your pterygoids so you can learn how to hit them every single time. 
This includes an anatomy review, right? Axial, sagittal, coronal slices, pterygoid planning. I'm including it, all right? And we're going to review a bunch of my previous PFAS cases, lower all in four cases, pre and post-op CTs. So you can see how I planned and executed those cases. And I'm going to critique my own cases so you guys can see my thought process on what I would have done differently. Because at the end of the day, we got to get better. Every surgery you do, you have to strive to get better. And I'm going to show you my thought process on how I get better and how I've improved so fast in this short period of time. Next, we're going to understand pre-op record collection and what's required to have a fully consistent and repeatable digital workflow. All right, so we're going to go over photography and the importance of pictures. Understand video and how to nail the correct video every time. How do we capture the correct bite? How do we tackle high smile line cases? How do we tackle collapsed video cases? I cover it all. All right, I've also included a pre-surgical fundamentals section, which includes my personal extraction techniques for all on X. Like I said, within two to three minutes, teeth are out. So I'll show you all that and how I do these full mouth extractions within minutes. I'll show you everything that I use for not only my extractions, but for my implant surgeries, my complete armamentarium to increase treatment efficiency. I'll show you the multiple implant kits that I use and I'll go over the components, the drill sequences that I use and how to ensure primary stability almost every single time so you can load every single case, even soft bone cases. And we'll do a model surgery together where I demonstrate on a, on a maxillary model my protocol for anterior tilted and pterygoid implant placement as well as the lower jaw all on four. Okay, and this is where it gets really valuable. We're going to go through multiple high definition live all on X surgeries in real time, upper and lower arches from a first person POV. Like you're literally standing in the operatory with me and it's all going to be narrated by me just like this, just like you see today. The revision surgery that I showed you at the very beginning of this presentation will be included. So you're going to see the surgery process and digital workflow of that case and others step by step. So we're talking CC reviews, pictures and case planning, fiducial marker placement and, and what the hell that is and why we even need it. Incision and flap design to have minimal bleeding and post-op pain. Alveoloplasty, where I show you multiple in surgery techniques so you can ensure you never have a transition line problem multiple sinus mapping techniques so you never drop your tilted implant into the sinus which is a nightmare anterior and tilted implant placement techniques for traditional all on four setup for those not placing pterygoids yet but i'll still show you pterygoid implant placement techniques and how i hit them almost every single time how to achieve 50 to 70 newton centimeters of torque on every implant consistently how do we deal with those super soft butter bone cases and immediately load them. We're gonna understand the ideal size and length implants for all on X and the algorithm that I use to load every case. Even when things are not going according to plan, I'll show you ways to pivot and not crack under pressure when implants are not torquing in the way they need to be. We're gonna understand jaw relationships and how to plan your implant placement accordingly from a prosthetically driven lens Right, I'm talking pseudo orthognathics here. I'll show you all that. Understanding MUA selection and timing to ensure perfect access holes using no MUA guides, just common sense. I'll go over how to prepare for closure so you consistently have healthy KG around your implants like you saw before, leading to long lasting results. I'll show you how I prepare for closure, my suturing techniques, and of course, the end closure result. We're going to go over photogrammetry, scanning, and my fully digital workflow and how it's done, leading to predictable same-day deliveries. And we're going to understand all on X occlusion and the tools that I personally use to ensure long-term success. And of course, we're going to go over the post-op CTs and we're going to have case discussions at the end. All right. A bonus for you because I care that much about your understanding and I want you to have the best product possible. 
you'll see how my in-house designer utilizes the digital data I provide for him and how he designs the prosthetic in his own exclusive modules. So you'll get a deeper understanding of all the scans necessary for a successful case and how to troubleshoot. And you'll get a deep dive into alignment of those scans and a look at the final design. All right. Another bonus, because I care that much. One thing I never had in my career was continued support. I had to travel all over the damn place and nobody ever supported me after the fact, after I spent insane amounts of money to learn from, from people. The continued support wasn't always there. So with me, you're going to be added to a private group where you can ask me and my designer questions that you have. They will come up. I promise you that. And I'm going to go one step further. We're going to do live Q and I zoom sessions where we can go over your cases, review your CT scans, go over your complications where you can ask me anything that you want about all next. So I want to be there as a resource for you guys. All right. Cause I didn't have that. And if I did have that, I probably wouldn't have had to spend all that money that I did and all that time. It would have been more streamlined and that's my goal. Okay. This is the best, most comprehensive all on X course on the market and it has continued support. And I truly believe that I put in so much work to make sure this course is perfect from start to finish. And it includes everything, the surgery, the pros and the digital, no a la carte BS where you have to pay for three different courses just to learn how to do this procedure in its entirety. You're learning from someone who does this and I do it at volume and I haven't forgot the struggle. I'm not 85 years old guys. I'm 29 and I've gone through the road to get here. I've made mistakes along the way and I've learned from them and I want to teach you from, from ultimately from my mistakes. Okay. I know how hard it is to learn all facets of all and X, but I figured out the tricks to the trade and how to break it down in a simple and easy to understand way. The surgery, the process, and the digital. If you are serious and you really want to learn this at the highest level, click the link below, fill out the application, and I'll be connecting with you guys soon. And for those of you who are still on the fence, please enjoy the following client testimonials. Hey guys, this is uh, Dr. Kush here from um, the Philadelphia area. And I just wanted to hop on here to talk about um, a recent course that I actually took. Um, I am a super GP, so I've been doing single implants, uh, over dentures, but nothing in the full arch game. And I recently took Dr. Neil's course for All On X, and it was actually a big game changer. In the last month, I've done about five to six full arches almost. The reason I wasn't doing them before is I practice by the way that if I'm not confident in de delivering care for my patients, I'm not going to do it. Um, Dr. Neil's course definitely has established that. That's why I'm even able to convert these cases because immediately after taking it, I felt very confident. I felt um, just knowledgeable in the all on X and the full arch game, which led to conversion of these cases. Uh, his mentorship has been through the roof as well in terms of, you know, the day of the surgery afterwards, post-op instructions, um, handling complications. It's been truly a incredible resource and more than that, it's been inspiring to see the patients uh, and how life-changing the procedure is. Um, if you're able to take this course, I mean, absolutely. Another big proponent of it is the price it's priced at. It is, in the all-on exam, everything is super expensive. Um, Dr. Neil has come up with such a great price point for this, where you're able to learn everything, you're able to start doing these cases, and on top of that, you're able to contact him. That's another big thing in this sector is like, once you take a CE course, you want to be able to be able to contact the mentor. And he's been there for every single one of my cases, actually. I've been able to reach out to him, even call him afterwards or go over the CT because that's been such a huge, you know, when you're first starting out, you get very nervous about that. So it, it, it's it's a big game changer. Um, and not only did it change the way I practice now, uh, I, love, I love surgery days. I am super confident in delivering that care. My patients feel that confidence actually. So that's been really nice to see. And it increases revenue, it boosts your production. Um, you know, the ROI on this course is astronomical, straight up. So uh, this is, I usually don't do these, but that's how that's how inspiring and life-changing this was. And I just wanted to uh, take the time to thank Dr. Neil. Uh, and you know, 
for the many artists to come in the future. Hey guys, I just took one of the best Onyx courses I've ever heard of or taken online. Dr. Neil does an amazing job of teaching everything from uh, everything, the, every part of the surgical aspect, the bone reduction, alveoloplasty, making room for pterygoids, the uh, relationship between the jaws and the occlusion. You've got the restorative aspect, the digital workflow, what can go right, what can go wrong. My head is absolutely swimming with knowledge right now, and I cannot wait to get back to the office on Monday to apply this. I am just absolutely stoked. It was an awesome course. Hey you guys, uh, I just finished taking one of the best all NX courses in the market. Um, Dr. Neil has done a phenomenal job over the last years documenting footage related to the uh, prosthetic workflows and the surgical workflows related to all NX surgeries. Uh, for those of you who may be beginners or intermediates in the space, uh, this course is specifically designed to, for you. Uh, it's very rare to find a course that kind of encompasses both the prosthetic workflows and the surgical elements related to all NX. Um, and it almost feels as if you are working alongside Dr. Neil, um, watching him do these types of procedures and truly uh, learning from, from him and his experiences in the All on X uh, journey. Um, I really am looking forward to kind of taking everything in and uh, from what I've learned in the course and applying it to my clinical practice. I highly recommend this course for anyone who is looking to enhance uh, their abilities to perform all next procedures. Hey, how's it going everyone? It's Dr. Darsh again. Every Sunday I come to the gym and I think about what I'm grateful for. And this Sunday I am grateful for Dr. Neil's All On X course. That course has changed my life. If you look at my Instagram, I'm doing all these surgeries, posting all these final results, posting all these different cases. Um, and all of that is because of his course. The surgical knowledge, surgical knowledge, digital workflow knowledge, and complications, prosthetics, you name it, that course has everything. What do you do when an implant fails? What do you do when your MUA strips? What do you do when this screw breaks? If you don't know the problem to that, you need to start taking this man's course. So go sign up for the course right now, and that's it. And you're gonna become an all on next master. Um, so I'll see you guys on the other side. So about a year ago, Dr. Neil and I, we started our journey together here at DeNovo. It was extremely refreshing um, dealing with a surgeon that cared about the same thing as I did on the prosthetic side, the restorative side. Um, he cared where his access holes were. He cared whether or not he did enough alveo. You know, we had sufficient restorative space. He cared about spread, AP spread. Um, all those things were important to him and that relationship that we have been able to build over the last year um, is is something incredible and mind-blowing i mean we are doing things now uh, that very that i would say a handful of the offices do uh, the fully digital offices do in this country maybe even the world you know we we're delivering cases with pre precision uh, predictable aesthetics and functionality uh, we're delivering that same day of surgery. Uh, we're able to do that because of the considerations that he takes during surgery um, and the steps that he takes after surgery to ensure that I'm receiving accurate and complete records. And I know for a fact that he's going to teach you everything you need to know about the surgical side, but also the prosthetic side as well too. You know, making sure those access holes are great, making sure you have complete records. Um, he's going to give you a complete comprehensive program in, your, in this course, and I cannot encourage you more to take this course. It's going to really up your game and make you the AOX master that you want to be. Hi everyone, my name is Toral Patel. I am a fourth year dental student at the University of Pennsylvania. I had the amazing opportunity to go through Dr. Neal's All on X course. And I have to say that even though this procedure is a little beyond my abilities right now, especially being a dental student, I can confidently say that I was able to conceptually grasp everything that he goes through. He goes through things like how to read a CT scan and how to treatment plan cases like this. He goes through the surgical and the prosthetic fundamentals regarding these procedures. And he, you know, he even shares things like his digital workflow. And going through this course, these are all things that I feel like during dental school, I barely had any exposure to, or we barely scratched the surface on. And being, you know, a new grad very soon and going into uh, private practice. And, you know, these are things that I do want to eventually get to. 
Um, I feel very lucky that I was able to go through this beta version of this course with him. Um, and you know, he always told me when he started making this course that he wants it easy enough that a dental student can understand it. So going through his lectures and his live surgeries, if there was any point, any point that I didn't understand something, you know, I provided feedback to him and he went in and changed the course. So it was easier to understand, um, easier to grasp the concepts. And I think he accomplished just that. I think a dental student can't understand exactly what he's talking about. And I feel like he did a really amazing job at making a concise course and going through all the essential topics regarding all on X. And I think it's a really valuable investment. And, you know, I'm very lucky to have this knowledge going into private practice now. And I think you guys would really enjoy it and benefit from it a lot. Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Bogle, and I'm here to talk to you today about taking your career to the next level. If you were anyone like me, and you were getting comfortable with all aspects of dentistry, and you were really looking for that right push to get into All on X, look no further, that opportunity is now. And if you haven't heard of Dr. Neil Chaudhary, he's done some of the best All on X work I've ever seen. You can just look up his work on Instagram. If it's anyone who I want to learn from, it's him. In his course, you learn everything from case selection to managing complications and even expecting the unexpected because that's what dentistry is all about, right? I can't tell you how much more profitable I've become and how much more rewarding dentistry has felt to me. So again, look no further. The opportunity is now to sign up and join the All on X Club. Cheers. Hey everyone, I just took Dr. Neil's All on X course and I gotta say, wow, I am so impressed. This course is just amazing. Dr. Neil is the man. He teaches you everything you need to know about the surgical processes, the restorative elements. Um, you know, I didn't know too much about All on X going into this, so I was kind of scared, but you know, I'm just, I have no regrets. I'm so happy I took this course uh, after, you know, taking a lot of single implant courses. Uh, this is by far the most holistic approach to full mouth rehabilitation you're going to get. Dr. Neil is just an amazing mentor. He explains everything in such a simple yet detailed approach that makes this course so effective. Guys, if you're on the fence or thinking about it, like just, just do it. Like I'm telling you, you have, you will not regret this. Um, I learned everything from like multi-unit abutment selection, alveoplasty, you know, uh, suturing, flap design, and most importantly, you know, the digital workflow, which is just so important in these cases. So guys, you know, I, I want to thank Dr. Neil again for, you know, making me so confident in All on X. And I just, I can't wait to get back to the practice and start doing these surgeries. Thank you again, Dr. Neil. You are the man.